Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I can welcome everyone back to uh, the Peterson Institute for International Economics. My name is Adam Posen. I'm president of the Peterson Institute. I'm delighted to have with us today three heavy hitters from Harvard. Um, well, actually, Larry, since um, Anna and, and Ed are going to be presenting slides, you may want to sit before coming up. Um, the topic of the day, of course, is central bank independence revisited, and the substantive prompting for this is not just the recurring political issues and realities, but that Ed Balls and Anna Stansbury have an important new study. It's a little more than a paper, at least in length. Um, an important new study that they've just put out a revised edition, and um, we are here to have a serious discussion of this. Uh, they'll be looking at whether the empirical case for central bank independence has collapsed, whether new powers central banks have accumulated are putting independence at risk, and what further reforms are needed at the U.S. Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. Um, central bank independence, I see many alumni of the, uh, of the, uh, the club, as it were, as well as many longtime observers and, and people trying to hold the club members accountable, which is exactly the combination we want here. Um, we are getting a little bit less of a crowd than the topic deserves, which I attribute partly to meeting fatigue, but partly to the odd fact that most central banks have come through relatively unscathed. As I mentioned in my summary of uh, Anna and Ed's paper, which doesn't do it justice, but anyway, most central banks have actually more powers now than they did before the crisis. The Federal Reserve is a notable exception. But the ECB, the Bank of England, the Swiss National Bank, the Bank of Japan, even the People's Bank of China, all seem to have a greater sway uh, than they did. And therefore, it's interesting from a political economy view, but therefore it's also all the more important that Ed and Anna have taken on this issue about what in practice we need from central banks. So we're going out live over the web, and of course the video and their paper will be available on the website indefinitely following that. Um, just to remind people about people who don't need much introduction, Ed Balls was UK Shadow Chancellor from 2011 to 2015. He previously served in the British Cabinet as Education Secretary from 2007 to 2010 in the Gordon Brown Labour government. He had been UK Minister for Financial Services and U Chief Economic Advisor to UK Treasury from 97 to 04, during which time he was Chair of the IMFC Deputies. But I think most importantly for today, the history shows that it was Ed, along with Gordon Brown, who in a very short amount of time after Labor won the 97 election, who decided to grant independence to the Bank of England, and as one of the people who benefited that, from that, along with the uh, 60 million or so UK citizens who did, I thank him for that. Uh, his co-author is Anna Stansbury, who's already a rising star. Uh, Anna is, I want to be sure I get this right, since Harvard's changed since I was there, is an economics PhD student at Harvard and a PhD scholar in Harvard's multidisciplinary program in inequality and social policy. She has an MA from the Kennedy School, a BA in economics from Cambridge. But again, importantly, she's already been out there with major research, including co-authoring with Larry Summers a study on wages and productivity growth that we featured at our conference last fall on the productivity slowdown. These two distinguished folks will present their paper, their research, and some of the implications for today. Then I will offer remarks, my qualification being 25 years ago, my dissertation and my first couple publications were on central bank independence and I've been keeping my hand in since then. But then of course the star attraction is Lawrence Summers will give discussion as well. Lauren, Larry was, of course, 71st Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton Administration. He was also Director of the White House National Economic Council in the Obama Administration, President of Harvard University, Chief Economist of the World Bank, Charles W. Elliott Prof University Professor at Harvard. And again, with relevance for today, he and Alberto Alessina did one of the very first papers uh, making the empirical case for central bank independence back in, I think it was 93, in the JMCB. So thank you all very much for joining us. Ed or Anna, I don't know what order you're going to speak in. I think Ed's first. 
Okay, please. Um, did they show you? They did. Can you make a person come up? Sure. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much indeed, um, Adam. Thank you, Adam. And um, great to be here with such um, a distinguished audience and our discussants, two distinguished academics and policymakers with um, great experience in this, uh, in this field. Um, the other thing I would just start by saying, we went into government in 1997 and made the Bank of England independent just um, 24 hours into the new administration, but three years before, we had started out the process of rethinking our economic policy with a conference in 1994 called New Policies for the Global, uh, for the Global Economy, at which our international speaker was C. Fred Bergsten from the Institute for International Economics. And I know Larry came along and uh, spoke at a subsequent conference or two in that period up to 1997. So there's a long association with these ideas, with the, the Institute. As Adam said, though, um, I had been a graduate student of Larry's between 88 and 1990. As a working paper, he had produced this paper with Alberto Alessina um, on central bank independence. And the interesting thing about the paper wasn't simply that it documented, really for the first time, the nature of um, the correlation between lower inflation and more central bank independence, but also that they showed in that paper that that gain happened without a cost, either in terms of output or the volatility of output. So kind of contrary to, um, to uh, the idea that central bank independence was a price you paid for low inflation, Larry and Alberta said there wasn't really a price. And for us thinking about how after the disaster of Britain's exit from the ERM in September 1992, trying to think about how to establish our credibility, this was a really important paper for us, uh, Alessina and Summers. There was a second paper three or four years later, which was also important, 1994, written by Stan Fisher and Guy DeBell, which looked at the distinction between Bundesbank-style full independence, political independence, goal independence, as they called it, and those central banks where the government had kept some control over setting the objective. And... The way in which we made our central bank independent, which we'll come back to in a moment, was very much in the operational independence uh, frame of De Bell and Fisher, 1994. And we weren't the only one. Following that Alessina and Summers paper, I'm not necessarily saying it was causal, um, but as you can see, from the 80s to the 2000s, across advanced economies, there was a big shift in the direction of... Um, central bank independence as, um, as measured by these, um, these studies. But in the 2000s pre-crisis, the correlation that Larry and Alberto had found started to fall apart. I mean, started to fall apart in an unusually low inflation era. And then came the financial crisis. And in a way, thinking pre and post financial crisis, pre, a consensus that central bank independence was a good thing which delivered low inflation without uh, an output cost, a build-up of financial sector risks, which pre-crisis was generally not seen, and generally not seen because, and I can speak from a British context, I was in the Treasury at the time, in a low inflation world, everybody, including our central bank, was pretty relaxed about the risks. In the uh, summer of 2006, a big operation was done between the financial regulator, the Bank of England and the Treasury to see, whether, to see whether any of our large clearing banks had any capital deficiencies and the answer was no, it was all fine. Uh, obviously that turned out to be wrong. Post-crisis, the consensus around central bank independence coming increasingly under pressure in a number of advanced co economies. As, um, as Adam said, new responsibilities for the central bank, but also the challenge of inflation not being low, but arguably... Um, too low, and we'll come back to that in a second. Public and political criticism. Um, politicians in Germany, in Britain, in America, academics, also are journalists. Is central bank losing its is independence losing its luster? Has it gone too far? Has it become too broad? Is this um, out of control, these new powerful central banks? What we decided to do in this presentation, though, is to look at the academic critiques, and we picked four. 
So first of all, the Posen critique, which goes back to Adam's thesis of 20 or so years ago, that fundamentally it never really mattered because central bank independence was a, a reflection of an underlying desire of policymakers to have low inflation. And um, I guess whether you had independence or not, we probably would have had the same outcomes. Adam can tell us if that's a fair characterization. Secondly, what we call the Alicina critique, which is that that shift towards operational independence in a British context was not really proper independence. I think it's kind of Italian in its, um, in its cast, this, that allowing any role for the elected politicians is almost bound to go wrong. Um, and so he called um, our kind of independence, a non-ECB Bundesbank-style independence, a minimalist view of bank independence. The Boiter critique, um, this is Willem Boiter, one of the first appointees, um, one of Adam's predecessors to the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. I actually rang Larry Summers from the Chancellor's office a month after the general election in 1997 and said, we're going to appoint Willem Boiter to be a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. And it took a while before Larry recovered enough to give me his view. Um, I think he coughed loudly and, and, and asked me the question, how would Mervyn King react? And I said, well, I'm not sure if we care because we want him to come in and have strong views. And he certainly did. But his critique is that independence, the changes since 2008 have been damaging because banks have become too broad and too powerful. It's the same as the Schorbler uh, view. Um, the Omar Issing view, that you need to return to a narrower form of central bank independence. And then our fourth one, which we're calling the Summers Critique, which is that central bank independence, ad as advocated by Larry, was a good policy in an era where inflation was higher and expectations were higher, and it was a challenge to get inflation down. But once you move um, to a lower inflation environment, an environment where inflation may be too low, and in which the challenge is sustaining aggregate demand, this may be a good policy for a different era and no longer the right policy for this era. And so we're going to look at each of those four critiques in our presentation. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Anna to talk about the next stage. Thank you. So as Ed mentioned, while there was a consensus that central bank independence was an important thing for central banks to move to, largely after the 1980s, 1990s, there was a range of different interpretations of what that would mean. We focus on two particular dimensions in our research that we think are important. One is operational independence, one is political independence. So the idea of operational independence, which is what the Bank of England was given, is the ability of the central bank to select and use monetary tools with autonomy in pursuit of its objective. It can manipulate the discount rate, conduct open market operations. It's free from pressure to finance the government. The concept of political independence is somewhat broader. It's the idea that a central bank is free from pressure from politicians to, that might influence monetary policy. Central bank might be considered less politically independent if the government sets its target, for example, if there's a government observer or advisor on the monetary policy decision-making group, if the government appoints, uh, politically appoints the uh, governor or the board of the central bank. So the Bank of England is an example of a central bank that is highly operationally independent, but not very politically independent. The ECB and, to some extent, the Fed are both fully operationally independent but more politically independent. Looking at those two dimensions gives us quite a different picture of the evolution of central bank independence. Between the 1980s and the early 2000s, on operational independence, almost all the advanced economy central banks became totally independent, as you see on the left-hand panel. But the right-hand graph shows you that actually most advanced economy central banks didn't change their degree of political independence almost at all over that period. As Ed said, the evidence first presented by Larry Summers and Alberto Alessina and then built upon suggested that central bank independence was negatively related with inflation, and that was very important in building the consensus that central bank independence would be important. But following Guy de Bell and Stan Fisher, you can see that only operational independence showed that correlation. When you break up central bank independence into these two dimensions, whether you look at just a correlation or a regression with a number of controls, central banks with more operational independence in the 1980s and 1970s had lower inflation. But central banks with more political independence had no relationship with inflation. Contrary to the Alicina critique, 
it seemed that operational independence was the one doing all the work, if you believe that central bank independence did have a causal effect at all. So we saw that this relationship between central bank independence and inflation didn't appear to hold in the 2000s. Regardless of the degree of central bank independence, all countries had low inflation in advanced economies. But if you think it was only operational independence that mattered, how has that picture changed? Looking at the blue, the blue dots are the 1980s and the green dots are the 2000s, what you see is that all advanced economy central banks essentially had high operational independence and low inflation in the 2000s in a manner that's entirely consistent with the previous relationship between operational independence and inflation. It doesn't, in fact, look like that relationship has broken down at all, or at least it's impossible to refute it from this evidence. Suggesting that if you believe this causal relationship in the 1980s and 1990s, there's no evidence to, to refute it today. The original claim for operational independence still holds. As we said, though, you've seen a broadening of central bank um, responsibility, in particular into macro prudential policy, extra powers and responsibilities, which Velen Boiter says goes too far. And you've also had the challenge of monetary fiscal coordination in a um, low inflation environment. Has that made independence not a contributor to, but a detriment to stability and sustained growth, contrary to that late 1980s Alicina Summers paper? So we're going to look at these two, two issues um, in order. First of all, but in order to do so, you have to ask yourself, when does it make sense for a policy to be independent of the government? And when does it make sense for the central bank to be the institution in which um, in independence would be um, positive? I mean, you can make a very strong case that food standards should be set independently of elected politicians but it's not clear why you'd ask the central bank to play uh, that role, or and even the, in, in the, the, um, the management of statistics tends to be the case that independence is important, but placing those roles in the central bank doesn't matter. So we set up in our paper in the second half, we go through in detail, the, in a normative way, what tests would you have, and then how do they apply to different policy areas? So first of all, when should a policy function be located in an independent institution? And the answer, and the answer we come up with f is four, f fourfold. First of all, when there is a, a political incentive for the political process to, to cheat or to, um, to game, and I should say as somebody who was elected for 10 years, um, it can either be that there genuinely is an incentive to cheat, or there can be a fear that the public slash the markets might think you could cheat, and either way, um, as a politician, you pay a, a cost for that. <laughs> Secondly, where you can clearly define the goal so that the government can say, get on and do that task for which the independent institution can be accountable. Thirdly, where your non-elected appointed officials are dealing in a world where there, there aren't first order distributional decisions. You aren't choosing to make, um, to distinguish between different types of companies or individuals. And fourthly, where you don't have a, an immediate and significant fiscal impact of the decisions that you uh, were making. I think if you were to ask the Fed to decide how much to spend on um, public spending each year, that would suddenly draw it into um, political controversy, which um, would be very difficult for it to sustain. If those are your tests, and I think um, these are pretty fair tests, Charlie Bean um, the former chief economist at the Bank of England did a speech just at the end of last year, the Wincott Lecture, which, and he reached similar conclusions around um, uh, to us, uh, the answer to this question. Well, how do these two, to these two um, policy areas measure up? First of all, well, of course, in monetary policy, there clearly is a political incentive to cheat, or there's certainly a fear amongst markets that government might cheat and keep interest rates too low to try and win an election. It's easy to define the goal of, um, through an inflation target. And I think we've shown that accountability mechanisms can work well. There's no first order distributional impact. Of course, decisions affect people differently, but the interest rate is the same interest rate applying to everybody. The government doesn't say, the central bank doesn't say, I'm gonna set a different interest rate for one part of the country rather than another, or for people of a different 
levels of um, income, the, the, there is a second order distribution impact, but the, government, but the central bank is not having to make discriminating decisions in that way. Of course, if you move into unconventional monetary policy, that becomes more contentious as a claim. And then fourthly, um, there, is, there is clearly a fiscal impact, but it's not um, the most important thing which is uh, going on. And um, fiscal policy is still clearly in the control of the government. Of course, there's no conflict with monetary policy. Of course, it makes sense for it to be in the central bank. When you move to systemic risk oversight macro financial policy, we argue this is much, much less clear. Of course, there is a, still the same political incentive to cheat, to not take difficult decisions in the run-up to an election, to try to hold back, for example, consumers borrowing excessively in the housing market or whatever. But I think it's proved extremely hard in the last 10 years since the financial crisis for governments or central banks to set out clearly what financial stability means, how it can be measured and how they can be held to account, certainly um, with no parallel to the setting of an inflation target. Thirdly, there absolutely are first order distributional impacts. The moment you move into uh, macro prudential uh, policy making, you are almost certainly discriminating between different types of individuals, different types of, um, of, of sectors or, or companies. And then I think in good times, there isn't a significant fiscal impact. But the moment um, the central bank has taken over control of macro prudential policy in good times and in bad times, well, we know very much from the last 10 years that the fiscal impact of things going wrong can be very, very substantial indeed. When should that institution be in the central bank? Well, uh, should it be in the central bank? Well, there is, is there a conflict with monetary policy? Potentially. Is there relevant expertise in the central bank? Absolutely. Where does this take you? Well, the, the Boiter, the Otmar Issing view, is that the best way to deal with this is just leave the central bank to target inflation and move financial macro prudential policy uh, somewhere else. Um, on the grounds I've just discussed, it's hard to define the goal. The distributional impact is first order. Significant risk of conflict with monetary policy and in fiscal impact. In our paper, though, we argue that there is an alternative solution if you think in the world of operational independence rather than political independence. And that is to distinguish between the operation of macro prudential policy and the setting of objectives and the oversight of macro prudential policy. And in our paper, we argue the right way to think about this is that you need some kind of regular overarching body responsible for monitoring systemic risks, for setting policy priorities, for trying to come up with the objective for financial stability, which needs to include members from the central bank, regulators and the government, but for a number of reasons, including uh, political accountability, but also to make sure that the central bank doesn't get left exposed if things start to get hot or go wrong. The best thing is for that to be chaired by a government representative. You, know, you would assume the, um, the, the, the finance minister. And then alongside that, a macro prudential body, which would be, in order to meet the objectives set by the systemic risk oversight body, would have the, the tools to operate independently from government, bringing together central banks, financial regulators, led by the central bank. And the way we think about this is to think at the, of the, at the moment of um, the contrast between the US and the UK. The UK has a macro prudential body with full macro prudential tools, which is run from within the Bank of England, chaired by the governor of the Bank of England with some outside uh, members. But we have no systemic risk oversight body. Uh, the, the setting of the financial stability objective is very unclear um, and not really properly set by the government. Um, in terms of conflict between monetary and macro prudential policy, that is internalized within the central bank. And I think most concerningly, if things start to get hot and difficult in, in, in terms of pre-crisis or going into a crisis, at the moment, all the risk in the UK is borne by the governor of the Bank of England and his senior staff. In the US, you have the opposite of this. You basically don't really have a macro prudential body which has 
the tools like the Financial Policy Committee has in order to be able to, in a systematic way, from the centre, run, um, uh, run macroprudential uh, policy. The Fed, as many people have pointed out, not least Stan Fisher in his latest speeches, uh, the Fed lacks the tools to run macroprudential policy effectively. I think there's lots of people in the US who would quite like to have a financial policy style committee within the Federal Reserve. But what the US does have, chaired by the Treasury Secretary, is a systemic risk oversight body, the FSOC, which has some powers, not maybe all the powers it should have. I think the, the argument we make in our paper is that a hybrid between the two, I think the Bank of England could do with an FSOC and the US system could do with the Financial Policy Committee within the Federal Reserve. And at that point, you'd start to solve the macro prudential policy question without the kind of risks that Boito and Issing and others have worried about. Monetary fiscal policy co coordination, again, clearly incentive to cheat, clearly defined goals, inflation target and fiscal objectives, absolutely um, first order distributional impacts. It's why nobody thinks handing over the process of making the budget to the central bank is a good idea. Clearly uh, fiscal impact because the, 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 the overall decision about the fiscal stance has big fiscal impa impact. No conflict with monetary policy. Well, um, there isn't a conflict because the management of monetary fiscal coordination is central um, to what the central bank has to do in good times as well as in difficult times. Relevant expertise, well, that's questionable. The question we ask in our paper is, is it possible to find a way consistent with central bank independence to solve the problem of monetary fiscal coordination in um, a time when inflation is very low, when um, the, the, the inflation is bound, bouncing against the zero lower bound, uh, in periods where central banks feel frustrated and exposed? And as we see in these, these quotes here, first of all, Ben Bernanke uh, talking about the post-crisis period. Fiscal policies, far from helping the economy, they appear to be actively working to hinder it. Monetary policy cannot carry the entire burden. The OECD, a stronger collective policy approach is urgently needed, focusing on getting use of fiscal and progress structural policies, strengthen growth and reduce financial risks. In the UK Article 4 2013, it's essential that fiscal policy supports the nascent recovery Plan, planned near-term fiscal tightening will be a drag on growth. That was absolutely the view of the chief economist and the UK Article 4 team. Um, the managing director at times took a different view. So the question we ask is, is there a way to try and solve this, um, this, this issue consistent with the tests we made uh, earlier for how you might make an institution independent? And one possible solution we came up with is a fiscal open letter, letter system that once the interest rate goes be below a predefined threshold, close to or at the zero lower bound, the central bank, bank would have the power to write a public letter to the government with its view on the appropriate stance of fiscal policy to help meet the inflation target. So at a time when the central bank feels it's got no more road to run in terms of cutting interest rates, but feels as a consequence the inflation target is going to be undershot, it would have the power to say publicly that it needs fiscal help from the authorities. I mean, I think this could only work if you um, had three different conditions. One, that the decision to send a letter was central bank triggered, that you could only do it if you were at or close to the zero lower bound. You couldn't have a situation where you were doing this at any level of inflation without drawing the central bank into very contentious politics. And of course, that the government retains control over the actual stance and content of fiscal policy. I think the case against this idea is that even in these unusual circumstances, the central bank ends up being drawn into the political frame. I think the counter argument, which, um, which, 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 or the, 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 the um, alternative view, is that what happens instead is you end up in a the central bank choosing to fetter its um, independence by allowing. Um, itself to be drawn informally into these kind of conversations. Although, as we've seen over the last 10 years, um, certainly from 2010 onwards, governments themselves were rather unkeen to have these kind of conversations and quite happy to let the central bank do all the work. So, to conclude, um, if it was ever alive, the pose and critique, um, as 
we feel that empirically we show that the case as it existed in the 70s and 80s sustains through the um, 90s and 2000s and into this period. It's not a time for throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Since the financial crisis, central banks have become less popular as their powers and responsibilities have increased. We argue that the way to find a solution isn't to withdraw the central bank from an area where its expertise is hugely valuable, but instead to try and find the right balance between operational independence and effective political oversight, with the conclusion that the UK at the moment lacks effective political oversight in macroprudential policy, whereas the US lacks effective operational independence and tools to do the macroprudential job, that no country has yet got it right on, on ma macroprudential policy, but the US and the UK have got a lot to learn from each other. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, we've arranged an ordering where Larry gets the last word. Um, so let me just make a few remarks to open. Their, their paper is, ex it's more, again, it's a very substantial piece of work, and it's important, and I'm grateful for it. And the clarity with which they have what they're calling their normative tests is, a, I think, a brilliant way to organize a lot of unwieldy administrative and institutional material. I do want to say a couple things, though, about some empirical claims they made in the paper before going through a little bit of my interpretation. Uh, Ed and Anna were kind enough to read my remarks at the uh, 20th anniversary conference of the Bank of England's independence, and this draws on that as well. I, the, I'm just back, I, I think the important thing is, I'm just back from Australia. And I got to participate in the Reserve Bank of Australia's conference on the 25th anniversary of inflation targeting. And the aforementioned brilliant Guy DeBell uh, was there and one of the lead-off speakers. What is fascinating is, and which I don't think, frankly, their empirical work entirely can take account of, is that the reduction in inflation around the world that we saw from the 80s through the 2000s was essentially overdetermined. We had the central bank move to central bank independence. We had an ideological shift. We had opening of capital controls, which put greater financial market pressure. We had lowering of inflation in two or three of the major economies, which then put pressure on the other ones that were outliers. We had the adoption of inflation targeting. There were a number of other factors. And so while I appreciate, and it's perfectly fine for Ed and Anna to sort of poke me as being a little extreme, Essentially, my argument about central bank independence is that it, it's, it's the tool you pick up when you're going down this road of low inflation, but it is not in and of itself the main causal mover. It's part of this general package. And that it only works when you already have a great deal of general support in the society for low inflation, otherwise it wouldn't work. And this relates to, in a sense, what they're calling Larry's critique the Summers view in their presentation, which is it may have been appropriate for a certain context, and it is probably not, or at least there's reason to doubt it's as appropriate for the current low inflation having to reflate context, which I have a lot of sympathy for. And so when we look at their paper, what I think is really important, why the reason I brought up Australia is not just to say I had a lovely time, but it's very interesting to look at the comparison of New Zealand, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, Reserve Bank of Australia because the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, when it was set up as independent and set up with inflation targeting, it was set up on very much the Alicina, Rogoff, explicitly Carl Walsh, if you, those of you who know monetary theory, model. That it was all about constraining the political choices of the central bank, there was going to be a very explicit contract for the central banker who would be punished if inflation was too low. It was very much focused on the goal side. And Australia was at the opposite end. If, if you think Alicina was saying that the Bank of England was, was not sufficiently independent, I can assure you if they had done a fair look at the RBA, they would have considered it completely captured. It's a much different structure. And yet we ended up with the same result. And so again, it's not that central bank independence doesn't matter, but it does, we do need to confront this. And so two other points. First, the, in their slides 14, I guess it is, 
they have the, the idea that down in the lower right corner, everybody is now, the lower right corner being high operational independence, low average inflation. But if there's no variation and all the central banks are in one corner, that doesn't disprove the idea that there may be something else driving both the central bank independence and the low inflation, which is all I'm trying to say. But more importantly, the issue that they raise, I think, is really big. If we take their result at face value, which I frankly have a lot of sympathy for, that it's the operational independence as defined by DeBell and Fisher that matters and not the goal independence. Then most of the rationales of the early days of central bank independence largely go away because the goal independence was about the central bank having a different inflation goal than the rest of society, the Rogoff argument. It was about in a, in a world of time inconsistency and the inflation credibility problem being the main driver, what, what Ed puts in the list as the first one, is there incentive for cheating, that that's the main reason to have an independent central bank is because you're constantly worried about inflation surprises and cheating. And as Alan Blinder and the late Ben McCallum pointed out really very early in this process, if the, if the inflation bias premium is so widespread and so inherent, why was it so easy to get rid of in so many places? So there's something, a very big question there. The other point just to raise is I'm afraid I do need to take issue with one assessment that Anna and, and Ed make. And it's their idea that there's no first order distributional impact of monetary policy. Central bankers find that convenient. I can assure you that when I was at the Bank of England as one of many voters on the policy committee, I stuck to that line. And you mean it in the sense that central bankers do not intentionally wish to dis redistribute. But I think that's different from saying there's no first order distributional effect. And our mutual friend Andy Haldane, I think, gave a speech in the last couple days in which he raised this very issue. I had been singing this song 25 years ago, that the trade-off between output and inflation to the degree it is affected by your emphasis on inflation does matter for differentially for different groups in society. The profitability of banking depends crucially on how inflation goes. In, in the worldview I had, part of the reason you had hyperinflation in Brazil was because the banking system adapted to it and therefore was perfectly comfortable with it in a way that in other places the banking system was highly opposed to inflation. So just to say that there, we, it is legitimate to say that there is no direct intent of monetary policy on a distributional basis the way fiscal policy is, but I think it's a little too cute to suggest that it's not distributive. And so let me pick up the pace. This is why I suggest that central banks are in the fray and not above it, because they are making choices that have distributional implications, and therefore the political factors do matter. So, I mean, basically, as I've said, central bank independence has been economic out overrated. Differences in legal structures have little consistent impact. I think independence matters most as the insulation of expertise and objective and technocrats, just as it would for army generals or Supreme Court justices or God willing attorney generals. But it's not so much about counterinflationary conservatism. And as Stan Fisher has pointed out, the central bank in the end gets held responsible for things like macroprudential policy, whether or not it actually is in charge of them. And so you need to think about that. So again, just to recap, the, the overall decline in inflation was explained little by CBI. The key thing is where they talk about operational independence past work shows that the key issue is whether or not in the advanced countries, the advanced economies, excuse me, um, central, independent central banks can refuse to buy bonds directly from the government. That was the divorce of the Banca d'Italia, the famous divorce. That was the big issue for the Bank of Japan. And in emerging markets, it's basically, does the governor get fired or shot? <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, Alex Kukerman had a bunch of data on turnover of central bank governors, and all these other aspects actually didn't predict anything. But if the central bank governor could be turned over any time they did something unpopular, then inflation went up. So it's a very much more limited set of issues. Let me skip over this. Um, so I think it's useful to talk about instrument versus goal independence, but there is a political aspect to do this. 
and so a lot of the things that Anna and Ed follow on and which is in the literature actually don't make that much difference. So mandates, for example, are all over. So it was always, as I pointed out a long time ago, amusing that the Bundesbank was very intent on having the ECB have a very narrow, specific narrow mandate only on price stability, whereas their neighbors, the Swiss National Bank, which delivered a similarly low record of low inflation across decades, had a harder job doing it because it was a small open economy, actually had a mandate that included almost everything out to cuckoo and chocolate prices, if you go back and read the Swiss National Bank's mandate. Similarly, committee structure, relative power of monetary policy voters, the difference between when a governor rules versus a committee, all these things actually vary quite a bit across supposedly similar central banks. And so that doesn't mean that they don't matter, but it may mean that they're very specific to the political context in which they develop and getting caught up in this very fancy design of central bank institutions may not be a great use of one's time. I think it's, I've used this example before, but I think it's very important that under duress, to both the Fed and the ECB in Ed and Anna's characterization are both operationally and goal independent, but they had completely different responses when QE came about. The Fed would, could only buy public obligations and would have been politically hammered for buying private obligations. To the extent they bought Fannie and Freddie and other things, people got very upset with them in Congress. The ECB, it was the opposite. Mario Draghi had to fight hard to allow them to do OMT and buy public things, but if they could buy un unmarketable French bank paper, the officials were happy. And these were very different means to the same end. Um, a critical issue is the fiscal indemnity from government, which we don't talk about, but which I think is important. The Bank of England, the ECB, had that, that if they lost money doing QE, they were covered. The Federal Reserve most definitely did not. And then I'll leave to Larry to talk about fiscal cooperation. I've already talked about this inflation bias story. So let me, let me just move on finally to this issue of financial stability. And one of the reasons I want to commend Anna and Ed for their paper is I think they're absolutely right to say not just let it be an accident, either of design or politics, that suddenly central banks are in charge of macro pro or not in charge of macro pro. It is a worthy topic of institutional design and it is different for many of the reasons Ed said from setting monetary policy. So I really will commend everyone to read the paper on that topic in particular. But again, we've had already very wide range of institutional models, very little difference in, in, income, in outcomes. The Bank of England as a time series is a fascinating case where they had the bank supervision inside, moved it out, moved it back in um, but it's, it seems to be that we have these ebb and flow of regulatory and supervisory regimes that reflect political conditions. They're not some institutional design factor. And I think that there is, and here I totally commend Anna and Ed, there is an additional added layer of distrust about letting unelected technocrats really get into this, this thing. When, when, it, when are housing prices too much? When are, when, when are or consumers risking too much? I mean, again, we may have to do it, but there is a legitimate democratic accountability. It's very different than the other form of central bank independence. And so I view it as a goal independence issue, and there's just too much discretion. So I think, going very academic for a moment, I, I believe we need to be thinking, if we are going to design macro pro, it has to be much more to a rules-based system than a discretion-based system. And so thinking about it in terms of independence may not be the most fruitful way. The, if there is, for example, a time inconsistency problem in inflation, there certainly is a time inconsistency problem about credit booms and institutions you don't want to fail on your watch. You need much more insulation and rules based to get around that. So I think we should talk about, get rid of some of the credibility talk. I think we should make common cause. It's not so much about central bank independence, but it's about technocrats having useful expertise and competence, and there's a reason to insulate them. But that, of course, relies on the DeBell and Fisher, and now I would say Balls and Stansbury distinction between instrument and goal independence. And I would really like to see discretion reduced for central banks in the macro pro regime. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.
I was uh, delighted to advise Ed Balls when he was a Kennedy Scholar um, at the Kennedy School uh, about 25 years ago. And I have been delighted to advise Anna Stansberry uh, when she uh, was in that program 25 years later. Anna had the good judgment to go on and get a PhD in economics, uh, which Ed lacked. Um, but perhaps the Harvard Economics Department's loss is uh, the British people's uh, gain. Um, in any event, I'm delighted to have a chance to talk about their paper, and actually more broadly, about the topic of uh, central bank uh, independence. And let me just make a number of observations. Uh, first, uh, Adam is right on his identification issue, but Anna and Ed are probably broadly right in their conclusions anyway. It must be true that if some societies decide to make their central banks independent and others don't, if some decide to take that step at some moments and others decide to take that step at other moments, that there are reasons why different societies make those different choices. And almost any reason you can think of for why two societies would make different choices would have implications for the kinds of policies they would prefer to pursue and the kind of macroeconomic performance they would be likely to have. And so in some sense, in some deep system, the central bank independence choices of any kind are endogenous and therefore speaking of their causal uh, impact is, uh, pro is uh, problematic. And you know, the example that everybody should keep in mind is European constitutions of the 1920s. Great intellectual effort went into designing the constitutions of a range of countries in Central Europe in the 1920s, and essentially history judges it all to have been completely irrelevant because those efforts were not rooted in any kind of social consensus. And so viewing this as a tool within a social consensus to both develop and promote a uh, social consensus and implement it uh, must be right. That said, uh, and I think I understood this when Alberto and I wrote our paper, uh, the comparisons and the kind of work that's been done in the comparative literature is, I think, nonetheless uh, suggestive of the fact that these policies can be a component of overall programs as a society seeks, in particular, to change uh, its attitude towards monetary policy. Second broad observation I'd make is, and uh, over time as this paper has evolved, Anna and Ed have moved more in the direction, I think, of recognizing this, and I think it is welcome. There's a core question about the role of technocrats in democratic governance. Technocrats in almost any area can make a compelling case for why generally supported technocrats left to make policy in their area will do a better job than politicians. Generals will be better at figuring out battlefield strategy. Diplomats will be better at managing uh, diplomacy. Uh, prosecutors will be better at managing uh, prosecutions. Social policy experts will be better at designing uh, social policies. And yet, we don't have government that takes the form principally of delegation to technocrats. And so judgments about delegation to technocrats have to be based on something more than uh, technocrats' uh, capacity to do the job better than uh, non-experts. And the most obvious example of a reason why independence might be best involves uh, issues of uh, 
dynamic consistency. That, I think, was a compelling argument when the problem was inflation. And it was a compelling argument when it was reasonable to believe that most of the political criticism from central banks would come from those who believed that the policies they were pursuing were excessively uh, tight. Ed's slide about uh, criticisms of central banks was very revealing. About 75 or 80 percent of the criticism that he described central banks as currently receiving was coming from those who believed that it should be pursuing tighter policy rather than easier policy. The case for insulating central banks from political criticism that they are pursuing overly easy policies is one that can't be squared, it seems to me, with the rationale that's talked about uh, about cheating. And that's why I think the case for central bank independence in any of its forms is uh, much less compelling today uh, than it was uh, two decades ago. Third observation, um, secular stagnation, uh, zero interest rate trap, and all of this. I would put the reality of the moment uh, this way. The industrial world is growing satisfactorily because everywhere in the industrial world, the combination of monetary and fiscal policies is something that 15 years ago would have been regarded as nuttily unsound. That is the case with uh, Japanese fiscal and monetary policy. It is surely the case with respect to American fiscal policy and perhaps the size of the central bank balance sheet. And it is quite likely the case with respect to European fiscal policy and with respect to uh, the European uh, monetary policy. I would further assert that if monetary and fiscal policy were not being carried on in a way that would have been regarded as nutty 15 years ago, there would not be sound growth anywhere in the industrial world. And so we are in a very different world. The view that, well, there's reasonable growth so we cannot think about secular stagnation anymore seems to me to miss the point entirely. Secular stagnation was not an argument for fatalism. It was an argument for policy. And in one way or another, the world has delivered monetary and fiscal policies in response to secular stagnation. It has precisely made the choice to take policy steps that would have been viewed as extraordinarily unorthodox in a previous period. And in fact, it seems to me the evidence of the last few years is evidence in favor of secular stagnation, not evidence uh, opposing secular stagnation in the, in the precise sense that if one asks the question with a constant fiscal and monetary policy, how close would we be to full employment? It seems to me that plausibly that number has moved downwards rather than upwards uh, over uh, time. And so it seems to me that there's no particular reason to suppose that it is going to be the case in the foreseeable future that the industrial world will be able to maintain full employment without unorth highly unorthodox fiscal and or monetary policy. In that context, it seems to me policy judgments have to involve judgments about the relative merits and demerits of, uns of what would previously have been regarded as unsound fiscal or monetary uh, policies. And I'm not sure the paper quite takes uh, that perspective. It's easy to say we don't like really unorthodox fiscal monetary policies, and so fiscal policy should 
do a set of things, particularly easy if you have responsibility for monetary policy. And similarly, if you have uh, responsibility for fiscal policy, but the question of where the burden of unsoundness should disproportionately be put over what interval doesn't seem to me to have been uh, fully, uh, rec fully uh, reckoned with. A few uh, briefer and uh, more um, comments that are a little bit more within the paradigm of uh, the uh, of the paper. Um, one, and Adam touched on this, uh, rec uh, referencing the emerging market uh, issues. I th it seems to me that the appointment power must be central to what is an independent central bank and what isn't. To what extent is it coterminous with government? To what extent is it influenced by legislatures? To what extent are there essentially non-politically -appoint, non appointed uh, people like the regional presidents uh, in uh, the United States? What is the de facto practicality of replacing people who were regarded as uncongenial? What mores surround reappointing people of the opposite uh, political party uh, to your own? It just seems to me that that must be a central set of issues for thinking about who has more and less independence, and I'd have liked to see the paper talk uh, more about it. Second, I think the largest lacuna in the paper and in much of the discussion is uh, open economy uh, issues. In our theories, though not exactly in practice, in our theories, uh, assuming a high degree of capital mobility, which is the case in all the industrial countries, you can either have an interest rate policy or you can have an exchange rate policy, but they are not independent. So your interest rate policy is your exchange rate policy. There's roughly every reason to think that your exchange rate policy should be subject to political control. It's highly distributional. It's highly sensitive in its impact across uh, different constituencies. It relates to the broader fabric of relations with uh, other uh, countries. It's got substantial overlap and impact with trade issues. A 10% move in the exchange rate is, after all, in many ways like a 10% tariff on all goods, and a 10% tariff on all goods is an extremely important event, as we've seen from uh, recent uh, discussions. So to say that central banks should determine monetary policies is to say that they should determine exchange rate policies, and why, given the criteria uh, that uh, are uh, adduced. And I think it is very plausible, and Adam could speak uh, to this, and Fred, if he were here, even more. Uh, if one believes that there has been a breakdown in international macroeconomic cooperation between the major countries. And if one believes, which I think there probably has been, and if one believes that that's highly consequential, that I think is much more, that I think is in fact much more debatable, then surely one of the reasons for it is that we now have independent central banks and that the likes of the Plaza Agreement where political leaders basically induced all the central bankers into an agreement around exchange rate coordination would involve a level of political pressure on central banks that would be unthinkable uh, today. So in any event, the set of issues around central bank, uh, around monetary policy being exchange rate policy, it seems to me needs much more discussion in thinking about central bank uh, independence. Just a couple, just a couple more uh, points. Um, debt management, it seems to me that if central banks have a reasonable sized balance sheet and they're gonna make some decision about that balance sheet and treasuries are going to decide about debt management policy, 
and yet it is all the debt of one country that taken together is the debt that has to be held by the public, which has some set of impacts on market prices. It seems to me that those decisions should be taken jointly, that their jointness should not be confined to situations when you are at uh, the zero lower bound. And I can imagine arguments as to precisely who should be dominant in the setting of uh, debt management. But the basic concept in the United States where the Treasury announces a debt management policy and sits in solemn contemplation with its borrowing advisors about term premiums and topics of uh, that uh, kind. And then the Fed decides entirely independently how much of it is going to undo, not referencing the public sector cost of whatever actions it's taking with respect to term premiums. That seems to me to be an absurd way to do business. And so it seems to me that the right approach for the United States, and I imagine for most other countries, though I would recognize that when you have a situation like the ECB, uh, where, the, where the central bank doesn't correspond to a political entity that issues debt are somewhat different, it seems to me that coordinated debt and monetary policy, debt uh, policies between the Treasury and uh, the central bank are appropriate everywhere. Finally, and here I'm somewhat prisoner of the US experience, I would have thought that one of the better arguments for more central bank uh, independence was the ability to do politically necessary bailouts that it is in fact the case that financial crises uh, arise, that when uh, financial uh, crises uh, arise, there is a need in ways that are often ad hoc and oriented to the moment to provide liquidity, that that is extremely difficult for political figures to take immediate political accountability for. And so allowing those who will not have to take political accountability the prerogative of doing what's necessary seems to me in an imperfect world a better solution than giving speeches about the importance of democratic accountability. Of everything that's been said here this morning, unless I misunderstood the thing I'm disagreed with most was um, Adam's advocacy of uh, rule-based finan rule financial crisis uh, policy, which seems to me to run contrary to everything we have learned about the necessary necessity of improvisation uh, in moments of crisis the difficulty of predicting the forms uh, which uh, crisis uh, will take and dangerously suggestive of a kind of moral hazard fundamentalism that holds that if we just have the right rules limiting bailouts, everyone uh, will uh, be uh, responsible. It seems to me that some kind of uh, ad hocery that permits very occasional twisting of the rules uh, is uh, desirable. If you ask yourself, I think most people would say that uh, while there is a heated argument about whether it would or would not have been legal for the Fed to have bailed out Lehman, I think most people would say that it would have been better if it was legal and if they had. And if you believe that, it seems to me you have to believe that having a central bank have substantial discretion to respond in an ad hoc way to uh, crises is desirable. 
that it's inconceivable that you would have carefully crafted a rule that would have permitted uh, Lehman had you sought to craft a rule in advance. And so much better to craft some relatively open-ended uh, authority and to assign it uh, to central banks. I think we've learned a lot from uh, this uh, paper and it certainly stimulated me uh, in a whole set of ways and I congratulate the authors. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I assure you I will spare you my attempt to rebut that last part. Uh, that's a topic for another day. What I will do is, as I come up to join the colleagues, is we'll allow Anna and Ed to make any responses they wish to make, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions. I see many distinguished scholars and practitioners in the audience who I'm sure we could benefit from the discussion. Anna or Ed? Um, so thank you so much to Adam and Larry for those very interesting comments. Um, I have a few points to respond and then I'll turn over to Ed for some responses from him. I think the key thing I want to highlight in response to these comments is why did we want to focus on this operational and political distinction in independence? Why does it matter? If there are no costs to central bank independence, it doesn't matter. And we don't need to have these debates about exactly whether appointment procedures and committee structures and where the goal is set for the central bank between the central bank and the government. We don't need to worry about them. But the, the issues post post financial crisis were that there do seem to be significant costs to central bank independence, specifically around the issues we raised on macroprudential policy and on monetary fiscal coordination. So we set out to try and find what, if any, of this concept of central bank independence was worth keeping. Was there some part of it that could give us the benefits that we saw of uh, central bank independence in monetary policy without preventing the necessary coordination with government on financial policy and on fiscal issues. Adam discussed uh, the differences between the number of central banks, such as the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, arguing that their structures were so very different, but they had very similar outcomes. In fact, we argue in our paper that they're not so very different on operational independence. They both have almost full operational independence, and all those differences come under these, these other more nebulous ideas of whether the whether the bank is totally insulated from any government influence and accountability versus somewhat uninsulated. So in the cases of secular stagnation, as Larry discussed, or of these uh, financial issues, it's clear that these political independence uh, aspects might have a cost to prevent coordination. It doesn't seem clear to us that operational independence might have a cost. Larry argued that there's not clear that there are many benefits from uh, central bank independence in a world where we are suffering from low inflation and the challenge is raising demand and not lowering it. But it's also not clear to us that there are costs of maintaining that operational independence, and I think that's what would need to be proved in order to argue that you should get rid of it. If there are benefits from it in a high inflation environment and no costs in a low inflation environment, then rather than throwing out your central bank architecture every 20 years when the macroeconomic paradigm appears to change, it seems sensible to prune it such that it's resilient to different types of macroeconomic architecture. I think we're following on from that. I mean, it clearly is the case that the context is hugely important. And the context is um, uh, both about public attitudes, but also the particular point you are at um, in your policy development. When we made the Bank of England independent in 1997, it was very context specific. Inflation was low. You had a Labour government coming in, which had been out of power for 18 years. Um, the history of past Labour governments had been very difficult relationships between uh, the government and the central bank uh, in the um, late 20s, 30s, and then in the 1960s into the 70s. You had a very personalised setup between the governor and the then Conservative Chancellor, which would have been catastrophic um, for a Labour Chancellor. Uh, it was also the case, though, that um, the question was, was Britain going to join the, um, uh, the single currency? And uh, we needed to have some way to show that we could lock in a credible framework without having to join the single currency. We very consciously made the central bank independent in a non-European treaty, Maastricht treaty compliant uh, 
way to do it in a British way. And I think if you are the decision maker who makes a central bank independent, you, um, you're always going to be responsible for every decision that they subsequently make. It's only when you've had the Federal Reserve for 100 years that some of the pressure is um, taken off. And so part of our motivation for operational independence was we wanted to make sure that we appointed sensible people and set an objective which bound them into, as far as we could um, ensure, doing the right thing. And in the period, the first 10 years of operation of bank independence after 1997, the only real frustration we ever had with the central bank was that at times we thought they should have raised interest rates earlier and harder. So it was the opposite of us having this incentive to cheat and being, um, being prevented from doing so. It was more that we kind of felt that um, they weren't doing enough to meet their mandate. Once you think of it like that, then um, this point about the distinction between operational and full independence is really important. But the answer to Larry's question on exchange rates is in a full independence world, maybe in a Fed world, this is a dilemma. But it's actually not a dilemma in the world of operational independence. You can have an independent central bank and choose, for example, to join an exchange rate mechanism. That's a government decision. It was a government decision to tell the independent Bundesbank that it was going to prioritize the exchange um, target over anything else. You can choose to say, as we said after 1997, the objective is low and stable inflation, and we will allow the exchange rate to find its level. And we could have chosen a more complex and more difficult target, which is subject to certain exchange rate outcomes, we would like you to target this inflation uh, level. But I would have been for the government to set the, um, uh, the, the choice, the, the objective, rather than um, simply handing it over to the, uh, to the uh, central bank. Um, the interesting question on Larry, I totally agree with what Larry said about, about um, debt management, and we say that in the, in the paper. But it's interesting to think how different our political cultures are when it comes to, uh, to, macro, to macro prudential policy and bailouts. In the UK, it was absolutely the government which took on the chin the political accountability and responsibility for bailing out and nationalising our, our banks. In some ways, I think um, the, uh, the, the, it, would have, it, would have, it would have been impossible within a parliamentary democracy for the central bank to make that decision on their own and for that to have seemed to have been uh, legitimate. I think in reality, in those moments, in our system, the bank pulls away and um, the, the government takes over. And that is kind of how even these rules are written at the moment, but in a rather opaque uh, way. So in, in, a, in a second best system where it's not clear that anybody's actually got the power, allowing the Fed to do it de facto may be better than nothing. But in the UK system, it wouldn't be the Bank of England who would do that. It would be the, the uh, government. In some ways, the, 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 the motivation, I have to say, for um, the reforms which we put in place in terms of macro prudential policy are actually quite um, subtle. And in some ways, I think that the, the reason I have a concern about our current system goes exactly to Larry's point about moral hazard overload and the danger of um, becoming kind of too worried about these things, without going into personalities or into details, pre-2007 and in the early period of 2007, um, the UK Central Bank was very moral hazard uh, focused. And um, once you move into a world where decision making about um, intervention and macro prudential policy has been handed over entirely to the Central Bank, there is a danger that those, mal those moral hazard ideas become too dominant and for too long. The way things work currently in the British system as written is that if it is the case that the central bank concludes that they, they fear a systemic problem is arising, the central bank can then trigger a discussion with the finance minister about whether there is a problem and what you would do about it. The big danger in our system is, is not that... Um, the politicians would be left to hang out if the decision has to be made. The danger is that um, the central bank would make a decision under certain kinds of leadership that moral hazard means they don't really want to try and solve uh, the problem. I, we did a war game in the end of 2006 
pre-crisis, um, it was interesting because we'd, I was worried about our systems in the UK, and we had asked the Bank of England to come up with a, um, a case study. And the case study they came up, which we wargamed over two weeks, um, was of a northern building society which got into trouble because its collateral turned out to be badly valued. And one of our clearing banks was hugely exposed. And therefore, the question was, was this clearing bank suddenly going to lose access to the mar markets? And it ended up with a three-hour meeting between myself, I was the finance uh, minister de facto, um, with Gordon Brown, Callum McCarthy, our regulator, and the governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King. And in that meeting, where the three of us were there, uh, Callum was clear that this was a big problem, we had to step in, or else the cash machines would run out. And the governor of the Bank of England's view was that the moral hazard signal which would be sent by such an intervention would be sufficiently bad that the best thing to do was to, um, to allow the clearing bank, the big bank, to, to go bust and deal with the consequences. And um, luckily I was in the chair and said, we're not doing that, Mervyn. Um, and uh, we intervened at six o'clock that evening. In a world in which you have placed all of that power uh, in the hands of the, the central bank, the danger is that the finance minister doesn't get the call until too late. And that is one of the, um, the concerns that I've always had um, in, this, in this system. I'd actually just like to add one other quick thing, if that's, um, which is that I think to address points that Adam and Larry raised on the distributional effects of inflation and monetary policy and on the exchange rates, I think the biggest threat to the our argument for central bank independence and the argument in general is that the argument is predicated on the idea that demand management policy doesn't have long-run effects on real outcomes. In that case, the distribution of effects of inflation should be expected, or of monetary policy, should be expected to net out over the cycle, even though they're going to happen um, as the interest rate moves around its natural rate. And the central bank is not going to be able to do much for the exchange rate in the long run, because the exchange rate will move to its real level. If you believe that there are significant hysteresis effects. If you believe that there is a long-term and not only a short-term trade-off between inflation and output and unemployment, then the distributional effects become so large as possibly to outweigh the benefits of central bank independence. And that, I think, is the, the threat that we should be worried about in the longer run. Well, and, and that was kind of the point that both the Bell and Fisher made and I made back in 1993 in our papers, that you were not seeing the decline in output inflation trade-offs, but anyway. Let, let me open up the floor. As I said, we have many distinguished folks right. at the can back, I one, please. Can I say one thing first? Sure. Um, somehow this, um, this discussion is bringing to mind a conversation, a rather heated conversation that Stan Fisher and I had roughly 20 years ago. I don't remember what the country was at issue, but the IMF had imposed some kind of rigorous conditionality on the country, which I regarded as being vaguely appropriate, as being appropriate. And the IMF was getting, uh, was being attacked uh, savagely by people from that country. And it was, there was a lot of criticism around of the IMF for imposing austerity. And the US government wasn't piling on, but it wasn't stepping up to the IMF's defense. And Stan was very angry that, you know, we're just getting killed, the IMF's reputation's getting hurt, this is doing us a lot of damage, and you're not stepping up. And I basically said, um, I'll think, of, we'll think about it, but, kind of the reason you exist and the reason you are structured as independent and the reason you designed this program, not we designed this program, was precisely so we would be politically insulated from the opprobrium that comes from, that comes from this. So this is kind of the way it is. And the reason I tell the story is it sort of does make a point about independent institutions, and I don't know quite how to even think about this, the optimal degree of independence. In some sense, you want them to be pure apolitical technocrats, 
But if you build them up too big, they'll start to worry about their popularity and their role in the world. And when they do, you may get some of the same problems that you were worried about in the first place. So there's an aspect of this that has to do, that has to do with what exactly the position, uh, the positioning of these independent institutions is. And sort of independent like the prosecutors at the DOJ are mm. is kind of different from independent like the IMF is. The, you know, prosecutors at the DOJ really aren't trying to make themselves popular so they can do something. Whereas the IMF sees raising its popular legitimacy as an important objective. And you see central bankers all over the world. You know, you, you see like all kinds of central bankers going off and giving speeches in small towns and meeting with coal miners and doing all kinds of things to demonstrate their political legitimacy. And it's at least a question sure. whether you want insulated things or whether you want independent things that will then seek to deliver, develop their own political reputations. But the interesting thing in our paper, we, we cite the bank, a big Bank of England study which asked central bankers about their attitudes and I think if you read the literature, I think probably if you look at the kind of advice that the fund would give governments, they would tell governments the more independent you make your central bank, the better. That was certain when you look at a lot of the, um, the literature, the academic literature, the assumption is more independence is a good thing. And then when you ask the central bankers themselves, in general, more independence isn't a good thing. They actually prefer a world in which um, the objective is set by the government, and they become narrowly technocratic about meeting that objective, because they can turn around and say, look, we're raising interest rates to meet this inflation target which the government set for us. I mean, all we're doing is what we've been asked to do, and so actually the, the political, the big objective political risk is absorbed by the politician, the doing is then absorbed by them, and the unusual thing about the IMF is they don't really have somebody who can set them their objective well, case by case, most because of us, supranational. Most of us in life, in most things, prefer autonomy without accountability. <laughs> it's what we generally want, and central banks are no exception to that. And operational independence is a kind of, lets us every day kind of do our business without anybody telling us what to do, yeah. but lets us point to somebody when the outcomes come out badly. And so that's right. it's kind of natural that that's what they would tend to gravitate towards favoring. That's true. But if you're a politician, the last thing you want is suddenly to find out in the heat of battle either that your central bank is being run by an inflation nutter or that your, inflation, uh, your central bank is being run by somebody who thinks uh, that preventing moral hazard is more important than the cash machines working in the stability of your financial system. And so from the politician's point of view, I think the key thing actually about, about independence is not, I mean, it, it's kind of time consistency. It's not about cheating. It's actually what you want to do is feel confident that the institution which you've asked to do a certain task will do that within the frame which you've set. And but if that you is, specify but that, that assumes, Ed, that, that you know what the right framework was from the start, and it assumes that there should be no learning on the part of the, of the, the, the agent. But you can Both change of, the objective. Well, yes, you can, and that's why we talk about this. But I think we should let other people Isn't it interesting, though, Adam? We should be. Isn't it interesting, Adam, that in the last 10 years, in this environment, governments have chosen not to change the objective? Yes, and I've been on the record pointing that out, that the biggest error I felt of the book I did with Bernanke, Laubach, and Mishkin on inflation targeting was that we said you should be able to reset the inflation target both in level and definition as circumstances change. Yeah. But ex post, it turned out that they treated them like fixed exchange rate pegs, and everyone was always scared to reset it because they were worried it would affect their credibility. So I completely agree with you that is an issue. Mm -hmm. But just saying that the politician wants to be sure that the person they put in place delivers what they thought that person was going to do is a very interesting and strenuous requirement. Think about the U.S. Supreme Court. 
if some of the people Richard Nixon had appointed had delivered what he thought they were going to deliver, we would have a very interesting state of affairs in the U.S. and maybe even worse political division. But those division judges are fiscally independent, not operationally independent. Because they don't, they don't have an objective set for them every year by the government. Yeah, but you again, you in the UK, you chose not to keep resetting the objective. So there's some under, you can't just say it's good that we have the provision to do that. There has to be some explanation for why people, those objectives are so sticky. And we can intuit that you don't want to be seen as changing it too often because then you look like a, like a, flip, a flippant person. But there still might be something to be said for changing it more often. Let me turn to our audience. This is on the record. It's great fun, as you can see. Um, please identify yourself when asking a question. We have a roving mic up front in Jessica's hand. However, everyone seems to have migrated to the back, so please. And if you could just identify. Sure. Hello, thank you. This is Nellie Lang from uh, Brookings. Um, I enjoyed the paper very much, and I think the distinctions between goal and operational independence are really important. My question has to do with the systemic risk assessment and macroprudential policy. Um, you know, many international bodies, IMF, BIS, FSB, sort of promote a really strong role for the central bank, in part because it solves that time inconsistency problem. And so we've, I've been doing a little bit of research. Th there is a question here, but I was looking at countries where 42 financial stability committees have been created over the last five or six years. And in the majority of them, ministries of finance are the chair. And it's, it strikes me as many of them can't do anything. They don't have tools. There's a ministry of finance. I guess I'm a bit skeptical that this is the best outcome that one would imagine for developing macro prudential policies. But I think that is what you're suggesting. And I guess my question is, for something like the UK FPC, where there is a lot of responsibility in the central bank, why isn't that the system with something like an open letter with, with the Treasury or the Finance Ministry? You know, why is it that you would want total separation? Oh, that's my question. Thank you. So we're arguing in the UK that you should keep the Financial Policy Committee chaired by the, um, the governor within the central bank. Um, personally, I think I would actually publish detailed minutes of the Financial Policy Committee's deliberations as well. But the reality is that the Financial Policy Committee has much less public scrutiny. Its objective is opaque. And when it comes to a crisis, it won't be the Financial Policy Committee in those circumstances which will be making the decisions. It will actually come back to a combination of the Treasury and the central bank together. So what we propose is the right thing to do is have an FSOC style um, systemic oversight body, you can call it what you like, which might meet once a year or once every six months, chaired by the Treasury, whose job is to set the objective for macro prudential policy and financial stability. It might say what its concerns are or what its priorities are. It would mean that you have a flow of information involving the Treasury, the finance ministry, happening on a regular basis. You absolutely hand over to the FPC the month by month or quarter by quarter decisions on financial policy, but the Treasury owns the objective, as they do currently with the inflation target. They're involved in the conversation, and then once you start to get into a more difficult environment in which, in the UK system, the Treasury will take the lead, you already have a structural body in existence which can then kind of kick into to action. And I think one concern here which is really important if you if you're worried about the balance between stability and and um, moral hazard if you have within your central bank an overarching governor of the central bank and then maybe underneath uh, a chief economist but also your prudential regulator um, uh, and we have that in system in the, the UK one of the deputy governors is a, um, in charge of prudential regulation. If that deputy governor thinks, I'm actually quite worried about what's going on, I think there is a growing systemic issue here, refers that within the central bank, and the governor of the central bank says, well, actually, I think in the end, the mole has an issue's trump, and therefore we're not going to take this any further. I'm not going to even contact the, um, the finance minister. I think that's potentially quite a dangerous and destabilizing situation, and it's a potentially very real situation, whereas once you've established your six-monthly 
oversight systemic body which the finance minister chairs, that deputy governor, who you know is involved in the monthly macro pre decision making, already has a forum outside the central bank in which you can elevate if you're worried that the way the central bank is internalizing the tension between the inflation target, moral hazard, macro pru um, is, being, is being done. So our argument is not ditch the FPC, it's add, in addition, an FSOC style body. You always have to be careful saying that because I know the FSOC is not hugely popular in the, the US, but it's sort of, it's a way of thinking about its role, it's what it should be doing. Mm -hmm. So just two comments to that. One is it's not clear to me why an FSOC type body would have the incentive to identify systemic risks that are building. And these cycles may take maybe, you know, multi-year kinds of events. Political, it's a very political entity. And identification often then says, well, what are you going to do about it? And they may not want to. So it's not clear what the incentives are. Um, and then within a but, central but that bank, is just, and then but, within a central But that is bank, just an argument against operational independence, isn't it? If you think that the politician as objective setter will always be short-termist and duck the difficult decisions, you should go for full political independence. I think most politicians are desperately worried that, that the central be. bank won't be doing enough to identify those kind of cyclical risks. And therefore, um, them empowering the central bank to go after those issues is actually where they'll be coming from. So it is interesting that no country has created a new body, you know, like an entirely separate body for financial stability. The second thing, within a central bank, I think, yeah, you know, you commented on the um, moral hazard versus um, the financial stability, macro prudential issues. Within a central bank, sometimes the ability to address macroprudential risks or financial stability risks gives them more flexibility on monetary policy. I think that's what a lot of central banks are thinking about currently. So there is the macroprudential policy crisis management and monetary policy, and they all have different conflicting objectives at times. But so that would be another argument in favor of more. Um, a stronger role for central bank. Be before, but thank you. This is very interesting. No, no. Paper. Before Ed and anybody else responds again to Nelly, I just want to pick up on that last point. There is something of a tension in central bankers doing that and also having central bankers keep insisting they have to use the instrument interest rate to get in all the cracks. So they obviously don't believe that many of these central bankers that macro pru actually works because you keep hearing them say, well, we should raise interest rates anyway. And so therefore, it's the exact opposite of what you're saying, that they're going to try to, because they have no faith in macro pru, they're going to add an additional goal to monetary policy. So I, I mean, in theory, it's nice, but that doesn't seem to be the revealed preference of central bankers. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Next, please. And then, did you have a, no, okay, please. Yeah, Nicolas Veron here at the Institute, also at Bruegel in Brussels. Um, thank you very much for this discussion, which was extremely thought-provoking. Uh, I apologize for have, not having read the paper le yet. There are no copies left outside. Uh, so it's 135 pages. It is available for download from the event website for everyone who's watching. So maybe uh, the questions I have are addressed in the paper. Uh, and there are two interrelated question, uh, questions. One is echoing the, the discussion uh, you all just had with Nelly, uh, which is uh, in your presentation, it struck me that you kind of seem to assume that macro prudential policy was an established framework, which uh, strikes me as a bold uh, claim. So do you have a discussion in your discussion of uh, 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 macro prudential policy? Do you have uh, that discussion of what do we exactly mean by that and how robust is uh, uh, the, the way we are using that expression? Uh, and the related question is what about micro prudential? So there's an, a, a huge debate going on in Germany and in uh, occasionally some other parts of the Eurozone on whether it's right that the ECB has now micro prudential supervision of all banks in the Eurozone under its uh, uh, mandate. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to have your thoughts specifically on this Eurozone case and more generally on how you see the issue of micro prudential uh, supervision of banks within a central bank. Thank you. In the paper, we um, I think when you are 
look at different tasks against the criteria we set out. I think you definitely want um, conduct, conduct to be happening somewhere else. When it comes to um, macro um, kind of prudential oversight and, and, and macro prudential regulation, I think we, we argue that, that, um, that there's a case for keeping it in the central bank and a case for not, and it's not clear um, which um, is the better way to go. As we know, pre-crisis, it turned out not to make any difference whether the central bank was in charge of macro prudential regulation uh, or not as to whether things went wrong under your, um, your jurisdiction. Um, the key thing is you have to have the people who lead macro prudential policy part of your um, decision-making process um, in good times and also in difficult times. What tends to happen, and it happened in, in the Bank of England, is that the government makes a decision to bring macro prudential regulation into the central bank and then starts building a series of firewalls to push it further and further away from the core of the central bank to try and give it some independence from the central bank in its operation. The key thing is you need to have people who are kind of coordinated in the way in which they make decisions. We don't in the paper go into the detail about macro prudential tools. I think part of the point we're making is in the UK, we now have a financial policy committee staffed up to use a series of macro prudential pool tools, but it's not at all clear, and this is very different from monetary policy, which tools it does or should use for which purposes, what the purpose is, how you would measure the objective, and how um, it should be accountable. So the combination of having institutions set up to do that task with the, um, the um, opaqueness of the tools and the objective is partly what I think becomes risky from the central bank's point of view. If things go wrong, um, then they are really quite exposed. And so at a time when we are, I mean, I think it will always be harder to specify the objective than an inflation target in those cases, what I really think is, if I was a central bank, I would want to dip that politician's hand in the blood on the regular basis about what the objective broadly is, so that when I then make difficult decisions, I can turn around and say, well, we were doing this to meet what you asked us to do. And uh, full independence doesn't allow that process and therefore leaves the central bank really quite, um, quite exposed. Can I just record my high skepticism about the macro prudential uh, endeavor. It will be recalled that Alan Greenspan judged that there was irrational exuberance in the US stock market when it was at uh, 6,300. It will be recalled that the Federal Reserve did not discern that there was a major capital problem in the banks in the spring of 2008. Uh, it has been observed that when a stock market trip goes up by a factor of two within three years, it is more likely to double again than it is uh, to have as its uh, next as its uh, next step. The evidence on trading based on identifying bubbles and shorting them is that many people have done it once. And very few people have uh, done it uh, twice, and that there are always a certain number of people uh, who are uh, who are attempting to do it. Notice that if you judge there to be a bubble, and you act on the conviction that there is a bubble by tightening in some way, and the bubble was on a trajectory to bursting 60 days hence you have almost certainly been pro-cyclical because monetary policy or other kinds of policy operate within a substantial lag. And so the case for being macroprudential rests on an ability to identify bubbles that are bubbly enough that they should be stopped, but not bubbly enough that there's a high risk that they will collapse uh, within the next, uh, six, within the next uh, six months. The capacity of central bankers to do that, whether they plan to respond by varying some kind of capital requirement or whether they plan to respond by varying interest rates seems to me to be very much in question. And so I think the enthusiasm for discussing the institutional architecture 
is running well ahead of the state of economic science in terms of being able to identify uh, the uh, risky moment. But the interesting question, Larry, is over the last nine years, government after government has decided to set up some kind of macro prudential process which it hands to the central bank, and central bank after central bank has decided willingly and enthusiastically to embrace that role. And on the base of what you said, that's exactly rationally what the government should do, and it's completely irrational for the central bank to, in an independent way, take on that task, because it's on a harding to nothing. Is that true? I mean, are, are central ba banks essentially being sold a pup by governments who want to push Ed. that responsibility towards them? I, Ed, you were the author, I believe, of um, many years ago, uh, you working with uh, Gordon Brown, were the author of what I found to be at the time one of the least credible international economic proposals of the last quarter century. Uh, the suggestion that there be an independent within the IMF warning unit that was designed to give warning of, to tell everybody in advance when there was going to be an emerging market crisis. I think it still and got to agreed, be didn't it? I mean, what? I think it, um, it still got agreed and implemented, didn't it? But that's I don't think so. But, that, uh, but that's not of. certainly in any way that ever proved operational. Um, look, I think the answer is should central should central banks. I think central banks should be very careful about creating an expectation that they are somehow going to discern bubbles and warn the public uh, when there is a bubble. I think most central bankers, most of the time, have been relatively careful about it. I thought it was a low moment in U.S. central banking when the Fed, in one of its semi-annual reports, announced that in its judgment there was a uh, bubble building in biotech stocks. How the Fed, which didn't have a single Ph.D. in biology, um, could possibly have had a basis for confidently reaching that judgment, I can't imagine. And so I think there are errors, but I think in general, having some authority is probably a good thing, but I think that central banks need to be very careful about taking on some kind of accountability for uh, there being uh, financial stability. And I worry about conversations like the one that we're having till I intervened that seem to presume a feasibility of macro prudential and then to regard the interesting questions as being where the responsibility and just how the responsibility should be allocated when it seems to me the right first approximation is um, that occasionally there'll be bubbles and they'll burst but the ability to identify when that's a greater or a lesser risk seems to me not high. Another way to, to think about this more generically is that there are fads and commonalities in, in movements in where governments and central banks go, and not all of them are necessarily right. We had the monetarist fad of the 80s. It turns out the central bank independence fad was a good one, and it turns out reducing inflation was easier than we thought it would be. It turned out to stick more than we thought it would be. So just arguing from the fact that everybody did it is not the way I think we want to go. Does that mean that the FSOC with the Fed attempting to identify systemically important institutions and focus more upon their financial strength, is that, is that, is that a fad or is that a good thing? I view it as a fad, but that's me. Is it a fad line? I think attempting, to, attempting to recognize that there are certain institutions that are more systemic than others, which is not a time series judgment, but a cross-section judgment, seems to me to be a reasonable uh, thing. To, uh, and to focus, super, focus extra supervision on those institutions that, is seems that, is to, that, that, that seems to me to be a sensible thing, but that's quite different. Isn't that macroprudential thinking? No. Well, I don't know what, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the term, if the, if the term refers to an ability to over time monitor events and discern that these are particularly risky times 
and take particular actions. That seems to me to be closer to undoable than to be uh, substantially doable. I think that's a different thing than in, an inst in a setting where you have multiple different regulators with overlapping jurisdiction, yeah. having some attempt to make sure that somebody's taking an overall view of the institutions that could potentially pose the greatest threat. But most anything that the FSOC was likely to think of itself as regarding as appropriate in 2018 but inappropriate in 2020 would cause me to raise an eyebrow of skepticism. Ed, I'm not even sure your contention works because if you think about it and you look at the Japan crisis, it was a small bank crisis throughout the system and it was a crisis driven by lack of fraud. They had one medium-sized bank that went under, otherwise it was all small banks and yet it had huge systemic implications. You look at Switzerland, which very much identifies that there are two banks that are of enormous systemic importance to the whole country, and they've basically said, okay, we're going to move in and, and, and devote everything to, to keeping these banks. It, it's a vast oversimplification to just say, if we identify the SIFIs, sure. we're better off. I, I don't think that's right. The but great irony in the war game I told you about earlier in January of 2007 is that our financial regulator thought in this war game we should bring in ABN AMRO um, as the, the lifeboat to come in and take over because that would all be okay. I, I fear we've driven Bill Marie into despair. Yeah. Could you bring him close to the microphone and <laughs> give her the chance to talk? Yes, I'm just beginning, becoming a realist. Um, thank you so much. My name is Joe Marie Greasegrabber. I'm with New Rules for Global Finance. It's a it's a nonprofit organization. <clears throat> I have two uh, more basic questions. One is the, the goal that was described in the paper is uh, reducing inflation. Larry reminds us that in the United States it's also full employment, and I didn't see that fully discussed in the presentation as a, an appropriate and real goal for central banks. Number two, there's the idea of independence. There's independence from the, the parliament or the Congress. What about the independence from the political powers of the financial institutions? Especially in the United States, we non-professionals worry about the closeness to the banks themselves. There is representative of labor, yes, but very small and slight. So what is the independence from the financial institutions given they didn't seem to get hurt in the last crisis, but a whole lot of common people and workers did? I'm kind of sympathetic to some of what you said, but you kind of took it a little far, I think. Um, Yes, I think it's good that the Fed has a dual mandate because I'm not as convinced as some that monetary policy has no impacts on real outcomes over the long term. And I think some attention to favorable real outcomes is appropriate. So I think the dual mandate is important. And I'd regard the Fed's dual mandate as a better mandate than that of a number of other central banks that are only uh, mandates uh, or mandates around uh, inflation. I would uh, agree. With, I would agree with you that as a matter of principle, one needs to think about the set of political forces that operate on the central bank. Uh, I think the governance structure for the regional central banks that existed prior to the financial crisis um, was indefensible. Uh, the idea that uh, a key Goldman Sachs board member who was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs could be a public interest, could be in the category of public interest director um, alongside the three bank directors and the three business directors and could play a role in the selection of the CEO of his regulator uh, seems to me to not be remotely uh, defensible. The changes in Dodd-Frank were 
in the right direction on that set of issues. But it seems to me that concerns about excessive coziness um, are uh, are warranted in a variety of things one uh, could point to. I think a quite difficult issue where I gather the controller and the Fed are taking quite opposite views is how should we react to the fact, and it is, at least roughly speaking, a fact, that on a given Tuesday, there are between three and 400 employees of the federal government of the United States who come to work within one of the, any one of the major banks, go to an office within that major bank, work all day, eat lunch in the corporate cafeteria of that major bank, and go home at the end of the day from that major bank, and that there are 400 such people. Should one react by saying, oh, isn't it fantastic? We are looking at everything. The regulators are right on top of the job. Or should we think that the presence of those 400 people can't help but lead to a kind of cognitive capture and sense of identification uh, with the regulated? And I would rather incline to the latter uh, view. And so I think we need to think uh, very carefully. And I think there is a excessive sense of the financial community comprised of officials and uh, the institutions that they regulate um, that can be insidious. On the other hand, and I think this is a kind of profound problem in an ever more complicated world for democracy, um, take a very different problem for society, regulating nuclear power plants. You would like that to be done by people who are objective on the subject of nuclear power and its risks. On the other hand, why would you get a degree in nuclear engineering and become an expert on nuclear power if you didn't kind of think it was good? And so there is a very difficult challenge, and derivatives are kind of like that. And so there's a very difficult challenge of maintaining expertise and objectivity uh, in uh, regulation, and you can tilt too far in either direction. It's easy to get the uncoopted and entirely separate and independent, but there's a real danger that they will not understand a large part of what they're trying to deal with and that, too, can come to have substantial problems. Okay, let, me, let me ask my two colleagues to both pose their questions, and we will try to show some discipline and restraint that independent central bankers are so clearly devoted to. Um, please. I'm Bill Klein here from the Institute. Uh, I was su uh, su surprised by the conclusion that the Federal Reserve does not have uh, good uh, macro prudential capability. I'm, maybe it's a question of terminology, but I certainly agree that Dodd-Frank reduced its flexibility for providing lender of last resort uh, support. And there's a nice paper by Tim Geithner, which has a whole long list of actions that they took in, in the Great Recession that could no longer be done given Dodd-Frank. Now, if that's what you mean, I understand it. But with the uh, presence now of the stress tests, uh, with the, you know, the, 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 the uh, leverage requirements, et cetera, I would have thought that more generally there is scope for macro pru, uh, that the Fed has it. So this, this, if, if you could elucidate what you think is the danger in terms of the Fed's lack of uh, macro pru tools, uh, I would be grateful. Martin, Martin Chorzempa here at the Institute. I want to ask a somewhat different question, which is looking long term at uh, the role of central banks and the future of central bank independence in a world in which 
we could imagine that central banks are issuing their own digital currencies. Many of them have already discussed doing it. You could potentially expand the functions of money. Uh, so the People's Bank of China has discussed potentially including, say, automating tax payments and implementing negative interest rates automatically through the code in that kind of policy. And that begins to look like the central bank is getting pretty far beyond what, uh, what the roles that they've played in the past with these brand new tools. Do you think that they can maintain the same kind of independence with this kind of change? Okay, thank you. I, I'll give right of first refusal to Anna since she ducked all the back and forth. Is there either of those you'd like to respond to? Sure. Um, I can quickly. Or both. I, it's fine. <laughs> Um, first, to address the first question on the Fed's macroprudential powers. So it's true that the Fed has had um, has substantially more macroprudential powers than it had since the crisis, and you mentioned the stress tests and some of the leverage requirements. I think when you compare it to certain other central banks, including the Bank of England, but not just the Bank of England, there are a number of tools that it doesn't have in its toolkit. Um, so some of the things that, for example, Stan Fisher highlighted in his recent speeches about the Fed are things like um, sectoral capital requirements, uh, time vary ability to impose time varying loan to value or debt to income requirements in say the mortgage market or other debt markets. Um, if you're skeptical about the ability of or the usefulness of those tools, it may not matter. But if you do think that they matter, then those tools are not available to the Fed. On the, I'd briefly address the second point as well on the digital money. I think the idea that the central bank can uh, can do negative interest rate policy with digital money could be either a boon or a threat to central bank independence. I think the advantage would be that you uh, you lose the many of the problems associated with a low interest rate and zero lower bound environment. So the central bank can respond in a way that might be more in, in line with conventional monetary policy and wouldn't get stuck. On the other hand, negative interest rate policy is likely to be hugely politically contentious. And so whether the central bank could do that with and retain its legitimacy seems an open question. Okay. Mary, do you want to add anything? Um, on negative interest rate policy, notice it's not the presence of digital money that's necessary for it, it's the absence of paper money. And I don't think anybody's really proposing to eliminate uh, paper money anytime soon. More generally, I think central banks mostly function in ways that don't have anything to do with the word money these days. Mostly they, mostly they function by setting an interest rate. And I don't think that any plausible set of innovations that cause checks to go away and digital money to take its place are likely over any interesting horizon to limit central bank's ability to do uh, to set uh, set base short term uh, interest rates. I think there's a kind of terminological set of ambiguities here as to what we mean by uh, macro what we mean by macro prudential. Um, my rather skeptical comments were directed at time-varying measures involving either interest rates or the kinds of things that Anna listed in an effort to stabilize uh, financial conditions. They were not directed at the ability to impose requirements on all institutions all the time that would operate uh, to uh, maintain uh, stability. I guess I'll just conclude by uh, observing, and some of you have heard me say this before, that um, a stress test that claims that if the Dow falls by 60%, the unemployment rate rises to 12%, housing prices decline substantially more than they did during the 2008 recession, um, and that all of that GDP declines by 6 or 7%, and that all of that can happen, and no bank will be in serious financial trouble or have any problem with being undercapitalized or illiquid, I kind of think says more about itself than it says about the health of uh, the banking system. And so I think it would be a mistake to suppose that all was well. I'll just end by saying, it, it's, it, when you think about how big political change occurs and the kind of things Larry and Adam talked about, about context, um, we had a big inflation shock in the 1970s into the early 80s. And then as a consequence of dealing with the aftermath of that, we ended up with a 
move towards more independent central banks focused on keeping inflation low. And if the crisis of the, um, the late 2000s had been a big unexpected inflation shock, that would have been catastrophic for the, um, the ongoing credibility of central bank, um, uh, independent central banks. But of course, that isn't what happened. And the sense was that within a low inflation environment, risks occurred which hadn't been properly monitored by central banks, by regulators, and by um, governments. And as a consequence of that, we've had a big shift towards a much greater role for central banks in monitoring um, those kind of potential macro prudential and, and financial stability risks. So we're now in a situation where um, if the next shock occurs, and it's an inflation shock, it was actually going to be quite a big blow for um, independent central banks, because that is still their job. But it's also the case, I think, compared to 10 years ago, um, our central banks are much more exposed than they were in the run up to 2007. If we have another financial bubble slash financial stability shock. So as somebody who's rather supportive of central banks and their independence, I think this is a more risky time now than it was for central banks 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, I think central banks are much, much more exposed. I think it may be that um, for good or bad reasons, that's what governments have engineered. And if you think there is some intrinsic worth in being able to maintain respected, credible, independent central banks playing a role in the setting of policy for the future, I think this is quite a worrying time. If we do see a big financial shock in the next five years, I think central banks will really take the heat. So my motivation is kind of worrying. I, I, my kind of response to Nelly would be that, you know, that she wants to give more power to central banks. And I'm kind of thinking they've already got rather a lot and they're quite exposed. And maybe the elected politicians need to take on a bit more risk than they're doing at the, uh, at the moment. If not, we could absolutely see the end of, the end of independent central banks in the next 10 years. Thank you, Ed. As the one, in addition to everything else, the one elected politician at the table, it's very good to have you conclude with that kind of big picture political judgment. Thanks to Lawrence Summers, who in addition to everything else is an executive committee member of the Institute's Board of Directors and a frequent speaker here. Thanks to Ed Balls and Anna Stansbury for sharing with us in such depth uh, look into their research and their very topical thinking about the future of central bank independence. And thanks to a very hardcore audience of serious central bank monetary policy and even macro pru aspiring policymakers, dare I say, um, who engaged with us on this occasion. Meeting is adjourned.